Good morning. Higher animals resemble humans in so many ways that philosophy and art have always felt obliged to determine the differences. Western modernity even considers man and animal to be opposites. It is only the human being who possesses language systems, consciousness and social manners, characteristics distinguishing us from the animal. Whether as the zoon politikon the animal rationale, or in essentially modern terms, the body machine that thinks, there is unquestion unquestionably one thing man is not, an animal amongst animals. Man has an exceptional position among other worldly life forms. This means reality is divided into two worlds. We inhabit one world, they inhabit the other. Ours is called culture and is created by free subjects, while theirs is called nature and contains living objects which, however, are without any cognition or will. Empirical encounters with animals, especially in the reinforcing frame of contemporary art and theater, draw a very different picture. Here, animals seem to undercut the modern ontology separating the world into human subjects as self-conscious, self-transparent, intentional agents from non-human objects, including animals, totally dependent on their power of disposal. This linear gap refuses to hold. Here it becomes evident that the animal kingdom is far too, di far too diverse to even properly speak about the animal, only from the perspective of the human being construed as an exception from nature, does the diversity of beings ranging from tiny insects to great apes appear as the animal. Here we learn that the word animal merely designates the living other of the human being and that it is thus, in fact, an anthropological category. 
Here, in fact, animals fill a whole range of forms of life between conscious humans on one side and inanimate things on the other, l'animal n'existe pas. This image is supported by more recent scientific findings. They have shown that the mental and social capabilities of man, allegedly shaped by a free will, are in fact largely determined by his physi physiological condition. And on the other side of the coin, animals possess highly developed cognitive faculties facilitating social learning and enabling tool and sign use. The animal is not the opposite, the opposite of man. Things are far more complicated than that. So when things get comp complicated, then almost inevitably art appears on the scene. It explores the field of philosophical vagueness and creates images of possible realities. With regard to animals, this often revolves around the relationship to humans. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And what does this mean for our interaction with them? How to live together? Thus, the fact that contemporary art has discovered animals, that the critters are increasingly prominent in the works, must be considered as a symptom. Why is that? Where does this contemporary need for new images of animals stem from? Perhaps because, because we currently do not exactly know what an animal actually is. Our notions are out of joint. As the American philosopher Donna Haraway emphasized, uh, human nature is an interspecies relationship, both on a material and on a conceptual level. It relies on a multiplicity of interior and exterior animal partners that make the conscious subject live. Plus, humans are, are always already dependent on the current concept of animality in their anthropologic self-determination, which is to say, new images of animals have consequences for our self-image as humans. It has already become quite common to address the human subject as the human animal and its living others as non-human animals, thereby shifting the distinction away from the exclusive use of consciousness and language as markers for the exceptional status of the human towards the inclusive use of liveliness and physicality as markers for the human position within the landscape of worldly life forms. What has thus been made explicit on the level of verbal articulation was already obvious on the level of intuition. The essentially modern human-animal divide, man is defined by that which separates him from the animal, never fully worked. The history of feelings towards animals proves that. Humans were never, not even in the darkest hours of modernity and industrialization, completely immune to the feeling of empathy with animals. And this feeling clearly implies that the one who experiences empathy with another feels in some way comparable or even similar to the other.
1997, French philosopher Jacques Derrida gave a 10-hour lecture on the question of the animal. It has proven extremely, extremely fruitful for the so-called animal studies, a new academic discipline that has crystallized around these issues in recent years. Derrida famously be begins by describing a very personal experience. He's standing naked in his bathroom one morning when his cat enters and catches a glance of the philosopher in his full frontal nudity. Being looked at naked like an animal by an animal, Derrida feels ashamed. Wondering where this unlikely reaction of his comes from, he revises the philosophical history of the modern human-animal divide, and that takes some time. A central problem in his rereading of the texts is the distinction between reaction and response. Along with the distinction between instinct and intention, it marks the borderline between animals and humans. When animals perform a certain action in relation to a stimulus, we, moderns, tend to understand it as a general reaction, which is guided by an impersonal instinct, that is, a force which cannot be attributed to this or that animal, but only to the species across the board, shaped by evolution. On the contrary, when we humans act upon an influence, we tend to understand it as a particular response following a more or less conscious, but nonetheless personal, intention. Thus, the distinction between man and animal runs along the threshold of subjectivity and authority. Is the action mastering the agent, or is the agent mastering the action? Derrida unfolds the ethical dimension of the problem by taking the concept of responsibility literally. The possibility of responsibility is based upon the ability to respond. Consequently, in modern terms, the addressee can only be human. In a strict sense, there can be no responsibility towards animals because they could never properly respond to it. This somewhat juridical perspective obviously neglects the fact that there are many forms of communication and care between human and non-human animals, most of which make no use of language in the narrow sense of the word. Human-animal communication is mainly a matter of physical activity. For a better understanding of these bodily doings, Belgian philosopher Marcian Desprez proposed the concept of isopraxis which designates a conjoint acting in a like manner that does not necessarily require that the actors understand the other's behavior. Donna Haraway, whose work draws intensively on Jacques Derrida, nevertheless critiques the philosopher for having missed an opportunity for an actual real-life interspecies communication here in that bathroom. Instead of writing a 10-hour, 300 pages long critique of the concept of animality in modern philosophy, he should have tried to actually communicate with that cat, to examine and improve his preconceptions in direct interaction with their object. Instead, following an all-too-human narcissistic impulse, he turns away, reflects on his own human condition, and writes a highly influential text.
J'en fais mon affaire. Leave him to me. Tu perds ton temps. He's a waste of time. C'est l'intelligence même. No, he's intelligence itself. Why not just call him a genius? Quelqu'un dans l'assistance veut-il bien m'indiquer un nombre de trois chiffres 772. 834. 834. Puis un seul chiffre de 2 à 9 au choix. 7. 3. Maintenant, notre calculateur va nous faire tout de suite et de tête l'opération. In 1909, Baltic German zoologist Jakob von Uxkull, inventor of the most influential Umwelt concept and arguably the first true, true ecologist, introduced a revolutionary idea into natural science, the animal as subject of an individual world, a world which, which exists only through it and to the extent that it is for it. For Uxkull's predecessors in the field of biology, the animal was merely an effect of larger natural processes. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck thought of it as product of its environment. The living conditions enforce certain habits upon the animal by which its body is shaped and iterated by reproduction. Thus, the individual organism exists only as its adaption to the milieu which is to say it is fully conditioned and defined by it. The actual effective subject of natural processes is nature itself, nature as environment and evolution. In a similar way, Charles Darwin famously delegated natural agency to the genetic material that shapes the history of a species via mutation and selection. The true subject of Darwin's nature are the genes who seem to produce this or that individual animal rather accidentally. Leaving the natural historical viewpoint aside, Uxkull discovers the animal as subject of a certain real life practice that constitutes its small but individual world. According to its sensual and motoric abilities, an animal can discern and effect certain things. To sufficiently understand it in its autopoetic and self-sustaining vital practices, the zoologist has to take its view and do point, which is to say its subjective perspective on the environment in both ways, passion and action. Uxkull conceptualizes the interrelation between organism and Umwelt as a function circle a feedback loop between stimulus and responsive action, which is internally processed by characteristic interconnections between sensors and effectors. This functionalist model that inspired both cybernetics and robotics seems to stand in the tra tradition of mechanistic conceptions of animal life. But in opposition to the rising zoological paradigm of behaviorism, Uxkull famously insists on the animal's subjecthood within its umwelt relations. It is not merely a machine indifferently executing automatic reaction patterns, but there is someone inhabiting the machine. There is an operator actively producing the almost personal connection between stimulus and response. 
The radical behaviorist claims that animals are machines and so are humans inasmuch as they are animals too. Uxkill, on the contrary, claims that since we know as humans that the senses do not deliver just any data, but it takes the act of sensing to produce a certain data, how can we neglect the fact that there is such an agency also in other higher animals? The same applies to their interventions into uh, the environment. Quote, whoever still holds the view that our sensory organs serve perception and our motor organs serve the production of effects will also not see in animals simply a mechanical assemblage. They will also discover the machine operator who is built into the organs just as we are into our body. But then he will address himself to animals not merely as objects, but also as subjects whose essential activities consist in perception and production of effects." Unquote. So with his famous statement that all reality is subjective appearance, Uxke doesn't dwell in the epistemologically safe zone of anthropology, but he reaches out to our fellow creatures he thereby envisions a biology embracing ontological risks. To avoid the traps of philosophical anthropocentrism, Uxkö makes use of a speculative anthropomorphism and states, just as humans, higher animals actively perceive and create or sustain a world. Their existential condition must also be characterized as a being in the world. Nevertheless, for us as humans who are to be in our world, there is an irreducible gap towards the animal that needs to be respected. Although we can know that an animal has a more or less subjective perspective on its world, we cannot know how it is like to inhabit that perspective. No matter how detailed our scientific knowledge about the individual or species is, about its sensory apparatus, neurophysiology, cerebral data processing, and semantic interpretation, we will never know what it is like to be this animal. Naturally, this also applies to humans, which is the very problem of intersubjectivity and a beautiful resource for misunderstandings, interpretation, and the emergence of the new. But anyway, we tend to think that we can guess, more or less accur accurately, how the world looks like through the eyes of another human being.
come to the end, and it's about theater. The cognitive mechanism that allows to see the world through the eyes of another person lies at the very heart of the possibility of conventional theater, which involves the identification of the spectator with the protagonist. To identify with means to put yourself virtually in the position of. Theater engenders an irresolvable tension between these two modes of experience, a first-hand experience of the theatrical situation and a second-hand experience from that which provokes identification. The spectator, the spectator constantly shifts from one perspective to the other, moving back and forth between the position she sits in and the one she is perceiving with. Thus, the spectator is elevated to a meta position, allowing her to reflect on the process of perception and meaning making between subject and object. An epistemic process which is nearly incomprehensible in the pragmatic relating to objects as tools in the everyday. The artistic framing essentially cuts those instrumental relations, thus rendering the mechanisms of relating visible. Furthermore, theater requires a certain trust or even faith into the object it puts forward, which goes along with an anthropomorphic charging of whatever it presents. This even seems to be the prerequisite for relating, at least for relating in terms of empathy and identification. Theater applied this way can function as an equalizing machine. It levels the ontological differences that precondition our orientation in the world and the way we approach certain entities, living or not, from humans to animals to objects or things. Everything we encounter in the position of the protagonist seems to be more alike to us than usual, which means more human. Theatre is thus essentially a humanistic art form, training humans in humanity by means of identification with what is presented as human. This historical legacy is deeply inscribed into theatrical mechanisms and you have to negotiate with them while staging an animal. Thus, the conjunction of animal and theater as incompatible entities can both reveal the deeply modern construction of animal and of theater. The impossible identification with the animal is the very motor of this dismantling process. Consequently, theater can be regarded as an effective means of working through the great divide between subject and object that constitutes its very possibility, and that defines humans as humans and animals as animals, at least for now, still. Thank you very much. <laughs>